Our first speaker and the keynote for this session is from Liz Wilde, who is a chief geologist at Shell with over 20 years experience, or, uh, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. We'll say that, we'll say that. Um, <laughs> she, she graduated from, from Bristol, um, and went into the service industry, and then subsequently became a junior geologist and worked her way up um, through you know, various different fields, um, fields with Shell, and, and is hoping, so if anyone from senior Shell is here, she's hoping for a posting out in the New Zealand area. So yeah, just, just, just to flag that. Uh, so Liz, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I, was, I always give the introduction that I've worked the ends uh, in the group. So that's uh, Netherlands, no North Sea, Nigeria, Namibia. So it's just logical that then my next, uh, next stop is, uh, is New Zealand. Um, I've been given instructions on the digitalization here, so I do hope that I work these um, correctly. Um, yeah, as as uh, I've just been introduced, my name is Liz Wilde. I am the uh, Global uh, Chief Geologist uh, for Shell. I, I was actually, I'm old enough um, and privileged enough to have met um, Janet Watson in person. So uh, it is an honor actually to be here um, giving a keynote um, in her name at, um, at this conference. Um, it's, there are, there are many things about digitalization, and I was asked to talk about digitalization and data and field development. I feel a little bit like a fraud because most of what I'm about to say has already been said by other people. So um, if you're expecting to, to catch some, some whiz-bang little secrets, then I'm afraid that I'm going to disappoint you. Um, but uh, equally, you can stick your... Uh, your eyelids down and have a snooze for 25 minutes and I have no objection to that providing that you don't snore so uh, let's get cracking so digitalization in the industry and data in the industry and why is it important it's about the energy challenge in in 20 or going forward specifically uh, in the next sort of 50 years we're facing a massive increase in our global population. It's predicted to uh, increase from uh, 7 to 9 billion in the next 50 years. With that, uh, we will double the energy demand uh, up to 2050, and that is energy generic, not gasoline specific. And we're predicting that at least 75% of the population will be living in cities. And with that, they will be demanding a lifestyle commensurate with what we've had in the West for decades and that we've taken pretty much for granted. So it's important, and it's very important for the oil and gas industry because with uh, oil prices predicted to remain around about $60, we're not ever, I suspect, going to be in a place of $100, $140 um, going forward. We're in a lower forever environment. And you combine that with the uh, energy transition that's ongoing, and really we have to remain competitive. And digitalization is a key enabler for the oil and gas industry to remain competitive um, going forward. So it matters. It matters because it will enable us to reduce costs, uh, to be, uh, increase our productivity, and also work in different business models. So it is important. What else? She says pressing something and nothing happening. OK, it was interesting this morning to hear um, Caroline talk about the fact that there were many, many different definitions of big data, and the same is true for digitalization. And in fact, digitalization has been uh, around for donkey's years. It's not new. Uh, it's certainly not the here and now, and it's not one off. Uh, and in some respects, the industry, the EMP industry, uh, were pioneers for digitalization through <coughs> reservoir simulation, production data, seismic. Um, so it, it's absolutely something that we've embraced, but we have been a little bit slow on, on the uptake. Uh, with respect to what we actually do, and that's our definition, in Shell, 
we use the definition of digitalization to mean uh, digital technologies that are, are going to be addressing a specific business challenge or something that's going to really impact uh, the industry in the future. And it's across the business. It, it's the whole value chain. We operate uh, prospect evaluation through analytics in expiration. I think I've used the pointer, if I can. Is that the pointer? Yeah. Prospect evaluation, we can go into um, drilling optimization uh, with analytics. We can go into procurement and materials management in construction. We can go through to um, uh, optimization of, of surveillance and, and inspection uh, in, in um, production. We can go through um, contracting and scheduling and planning optimization in the whole transportation network through to an enhanced um, experience on the forecourt for a customer. It's across the entire uh, value chain. But we have been very slow to embrace digitalization in the industry. That said, you cannot go down any corridor in any uh, oil company without somebody mentioning the word digitalization or big data. We've embraced this big bandwagon and we're off again on, on the uh, digitalization journey. So we're trying to catch up, but, but compared with industries like the car industry, the automotive industry, we are way, way behind. Okay, again, we've, uh, we've heard about this as well uh, in the last 25 years. I mean, I've been around more than 25 years. I mean, Steve and I were in university together. <laughs> and uh, I've heard it this morning as well from Nick. When I started and many of us started we did pretty much all our interpretation on paper cross sections maps correlations all paper driven and we stored those um, features in uh, filing cabinets as computing power grew <laughs> computers got bigger and bigger and bigger and then smaller and smaller and smaller and then we are now in a place where we live pretty much our entire lives off a mobile device. And with that, of course, we've got massively increased connectivity. And with that, huge, huge amounts of data. So not surprising that this conference is entitled Big Data. And in fact, uh, we've got a lot of data in Shell. Has anybody got any idea how much we've got in subsurface and wells. And I know there are people from Shell here, so. <laughs> and we the hazard a guess. Big number. Petabytes. Petabytes. It is petabytes, you're right. <coughs> we have between, this is just the subsurface and wells, we have between 60 and 70 petabytes of data. <laughs> now, if you're like me, you go, petabyte, hmm, I know that's big, but how big? It's 7 billion megabytes. Now, this presentation is 18 megabytes. So, 7 billion megabytes of data. And that's just in the subsurface and wells. It's humongous. Now, it, it might be hard to believe that um, not that long ago, together with NASA and the meteorolo meteorologists, can't speak, the industry was the biggest generators of data on the planet. You cannot say that now. I mean, we have to accept that, that companies like Netflix and YouTube generate way, way more data than we do. Equally, companies like Google, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon have much uh, better defined cloud infrastructures. But as the saying goes, it's not all about big. It's not just about the volume, it's also about value. And the people who recognized that they should marshal their data well and keep track of it and understand the importance of it are now very, very well placed to leverage that in the industry. <clears throat> so, so what does big data mean in digitalization and digitalization in field development? How can we leverage that data and that digitalization so, so that we can effectively um, develop those discovered hydrocarbon resources. <clears throat> and again, none of this is new. We've, we've heard all of this before. First up, 
and we've seen plenty of examples. Um, seismic is an obvious one. Nick mentioned it this morning as well. Seismic, in some respects, is a fantastic vehicle for utilising um, big data and digitalisation because it's data-rich and interpretation of it can be pretty tedious and time-consuming. So we've got lots and lots and lots of seismic data. Obviously, we started with um, 2D. We've now got increasingly spaced 3D. We can utilise machine learning on it and get much faster, more reliable interpretations. <clears throat> it was interesting uh, what Nick said this morning about um, picking uh, uh, high amplitudes and wondering whether that was going to be a, a discovery or not. There's always going to be an element of, of human QC, but you can certainly um, do your, your basic interpretation much faster than you used to. <clears throat> Increasingly, we also have 4D, so time-lapse. And, and in uh, an environment like in the North Sea, where our hydrocarbons are underneath the waves, the ability to have a consistency in a repeat survey is invaluable. It certainly saves a lot of money. Now, we usually um, shoot 4D in order to be able to monitor the movement of the hydrocarbons, the flood front. So that will enable us to better uh, locate our wells. But in this instance, we've actually also utilised it to identify uh, shallow gas in the, in the overburden. So we had, this is the reservoir here, and here we've got a shallow gas cloud, and we moved our wells in order to avoid that and therefore drill safer wells. So we've got seismic in various forms, and of course, again, we heard this this morning, there's the element of processing and reprocessing, wideband, as uh, you can go on and on and on, <clears throat> generating data. Then there's all manner of neural networks that you can, uh, you can utilise. I mean, this is um, simply a, a standard set of, of uh, wireline logs that we um, acquire. And um, you can, oh, wrong way, back. Uh, here we have... Uh, in the little red circles, if you can see them at the back, uh, uh, core permeability. Porosity is relatively easy to predict from logs. Permeability isn't. You need to have core porosity and permeability, and you can um, assign that to uncored intervals. But if you can apply neural networks to it, then you can predict what your permeability is going to be outside those cored intervals. So that gives you a much greater range of, of prediction with respect to where you think you might be able to um, uh, perforate the well. And then, and then, of course, we've also got pretty standard digitalised core photos, but it's not just um, core photos. I mean, this is standard three-foot lengths of core uh, with um, core plugs taken at, um, every metre. We, we standard di um, digitalization of those core photos, but also all the way down to the pore scale. So you can now interrogate a core totally digitally. And the advantage of that is that you, rather than taking your core plugs every one meter, you can take them in a fasces, which is mono fasces. So you know that you've got a digital core in one specific fasces. That means that you can have much uh, more reliable porosity and permeability measurements. That means that you can better decide where you're going to put your zonal perforations in your, in your perforation strategy. So hopefully you will have fewer lower performing wells. So what else? We've seen it also before um, this morning, but... We now routinely utilise um, wraparound and immersive technologies uh, with wearables so that everybody, not just geoscientists, can see in 3D. I mean, we take it as a given that we can see in 3D, um, but not everybody can. And I've worked with enough production technologists, and I've explained again and again and again what a fault might be. Uh, it's so much more powerful to be able to show them in, a, in an eye scope what this, what this is. And this is totally routine. So it helps you identify sweet spots. It helps you, again, avoid drilling hazards. 
so that you um, uh, drill well so, uh, safely. So uh, high performance computing power uh, not only helps with visualization, of course, it also helps in the entire subsurface modeling effort. Uh, if you have rapid access to data, then you can share that data more effectively. Uh, so geoscientists, reservoir engineers, petrophysicists, production technologists, uh, well engineers can all sit in the same room, they can share the data, you start to build a shared earth model. And if you have one model of the subsurface, you can start to have a, a much clearer picture of what's going on. If you've got a clearer picture, you can better understand the uncertainties. If you better understand the uncertainties, you can, you can um, manage the risks more effectively. If you manage the risks more effectively, you can make better or you can select more appropriate field development um, decisions and optimise recovery. So it's not uh, insignificant. And then there's the whole element around automation in well delivery itself. I mean, we, we now are able to place, because we can do real-time operations, we can place operators in remote locations totally away from the, um, the drilling rig, and they can operate not just one rig, but multiple rigs, up to four. So there's a cost saving there. There's, there's an element of safety improvement as well, because they're not on the rig, um, and they are managing it real time and in Shell we've been doing that on 70 rigs for the last five years so again that's relatively routine too. Through advanced analytics on with well delivery um, we can optimize our drilling parameters, we can improve the um, well locations again about safety and, and tweak loads and loads of operational performance indicators so that we're drilling wells cheaper and safer than we did before. Cheaper means that if you've only got a certain amount of money to go around, you've got more money to do something else, drill another well or, or do some, some more studies. Safer, of course, it goes without saying. We don't want to harm any of our people. And then probably the thing that has the biggest impact in the industry from um, a field development and um, monitoring perspective is the whole availability of um, low-cost autonomous vehicles. They're smart, they can, do make, they can, they can perform complex operations, uh, they're able to remove that human presence. So drones, very um, good example. We can fly drones along pipelines, they, can, they have heat sensors on them, they can see le leaks or potential leaks in the pipelines or on a wellhead. We can target our interventions. We don't have to send people out driving the whole pipeline or, 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 or along to the wellhead to check the wellhead. We can make proactive interventions. So again, that's about um, keeping the hydrocarbons flowing. You don't want an incident uh, if you can avoid it. You can be much more um, proactive. You can reduce the, the man hours exposure to your staff uh, and you can keep the whole um, um, business running. So that, all of that is pretty typical for the industry. <clears throat> but what about the future? Where, I've described where we went, where we were, where we are right now. What are some of the kernels that still niggle us in the future and what, what we need to, to solve? The first one is, is the D word again, data. Uh, we've done an awful lot of learning uh, in the industry. We've still got a significant amount of catching up um, still to do. Um, it's not so much about the data volume anymore, but it's about its complexity. And, and again, we've heard about this in this conference. Well data is relatively simple. It's time series. Subsurface data <coughs> isn't. It's complex. It's multiple models. It's multiple met metadata. It's unstructured. Searching it is not trivial, and cracking that will be absolutely key. Now, the advantage of having uh, being a, a slow follower is that unlike when we were pioneers, we don't have to invent things ourselves anymore. We can adopt and adapt. So we can use open um, standards. We can take tried and tested 
cloud services and adopt them to our own usage. We can take digital solutions and do the same thing. So it's not necessarily about not invented here. But obviously, like all these things, in, in an environment where we are much more driven by distributed data uh, and uh, the whole continuous records growth, then it, cyber security and the protection of your system integrity is absolutely must have. So there's always a flip side to these things. The other thing that we need to think about with respect to data is that not all data is equal to paraphrase George Orwell. We are developing more and more complex reservoirs. The reservoirs themselves, be it the lacustrine carbonates in the deep water of Brazil, or the recovery mechanisms that we need to employ for sour gas or enhanced oil recovery in Malaysia or the Gulf of Mexico or, or um, uh, Caspian much more complex <clears throat> so we need not just data but we need the right data in order to be able to effectively characterize our reservoirs otherwise it's just rubbish in rubbish out the other thing we need to do is to have our technology uh, platforms seamlessly talking to each other we need to get data into the cloud so people can or people, data can be available and accessed anytime, anywhere, any place. We can do it with our mobile phones. We can't yet do it effectively with our technology platforms. So that is absolutely, again, key. And that will give us a revolution in being able to talk to each other wherever we are in the world, be able to load our data up, um, analyze it, real time, back and forth, back and forth, that iterative loop will definitely increase. Then there's the workflow element. I mean, currently, our workflows are very subjective and slow. But having data in the cloud and easily accessible will in increase the ability to do machine learning and advanced analytics. And then that opens up a whole new way of working because your workflows will be data-driven and automotive, not, not human intervention. So if you think about using, again, the, the example of the mobile phone, if we take a picture on our phone, we use an app to edit that picture, we send that picture, all from our mobile phone. That is data-driven, automotive technology. Just think about what we could do if we could do that in the subsurface. <clears throat> we would have much more time to QC because you would be saving time. Automotive works would mean that you'd automatically get an updated velocity model, for example, or an updated porosity database. We don't have access to that available or that technology yet. <clears throat> but of course, with all these things, it also comes with a flip side because we might be able to increase our uh, advanced analytics and our machine learning, but how many of you would sign off a well proposal that has been generated by machine learning? How many of you would sign off an HSSE plan or a field development plan totally generated by, by robots? <clears throat> there's always a, a flip side. Then there's, well, again, we've heard about this, the whole collaboration um, uh, element Technical and economic success will always depend on having robust, um, safe, competitive uh, field development plans and reservoir management strategies. But collaboration is a cornerstone to that and it will only increase. Now, you, know, you think about what we have achieved with social media and our connectivity on social media. We're nowhere near that um, in the industry with respect to collaboration. Now, within... Our companies, collaboration, you can talk about collaboration, and I don't know about you, but in Shell they talk about collaboration a lot. Um, but what does it actually mean? For big data and digitalization, it's not just within company, but it's between company and, and from company to, to all sorts of other industries. And Nick touched on it this morning as well. I mean, in the North Sea, we are pretty mature um, basins, we've got moderate UDC, unit development costs. We have 
already matured ourselves into a position of collaboration <coughs> within the industry as well as competition. <coughs> but the advantages of having uh, data out in the cloud and available and accessible anywhere uh, is, are just enormous for the industry as a whole. We, we won't have to go through painful, that data isn't in that format. You know, we can share anywhere from any, any place and have much more um, uh, sensible conversations about what matters, which is the subsurface and, and trying to maximise the recovery uh, without having to be um, any manual intervention due to um, differences in data storage. So those are, those are four things that, that I think are probably um, going to impact us um, in the future. None of those are currently givens. But we're working them. Collectively, we're working them. Um, but none of them are right, uh, available like what I described before, right now. And if, if we don't work them and we don't crack it, we're not going to be able to move on. So what about the digitalised future of geoscientists? So many, many of you are, are millennials, uh, not all of you. Um, so you're very well used to that, that adapt and adopt philosophy of, of fail fast and move on, not, not the sequential A, then B, then C. <clears throat> but I'd ask you to ask yourself a more searching questions. I mean, what is it that this game that I'm playing with really doing? Is it doing what I want it to do? Because it's not the all singing, all dancing integrated platform that is in the driving seat, it's you. It's not the database that gets the bonus at the end of the year, it's you. So, uh, although we've, we've made big strides uh, in the industry, I, I think we've still got a little way, um, a way to go. As I've said before, um, you know, 25 years ago, it was a massive, massive change in the last 25 years. And I expect there to be a commensurate change in the next two, three, four, five, certainly 25. I can't even visualise 25 years and what, what might be there. <clears throat> but uh, some things um, won't change. And that despite all of that, we will, in the sort of digitalised, data-driven, connected environment that we're in, we will still always need high performance everywhere if we're going to have world-class um, wells, reservoir, uh, and field management. So now, what are you going to do? What are you actually going, what IT skills are you going to, to address? What data are you going to ask for and interrogate? And what software do you want? How are you going to make the industry safer than it is now? more competitive than it is now, and add value to come. So no, some things will not change. We will still need creative brains. We'll still need deep technical expertise if we're going to power progress together and generate more and cleaner energy for the world. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Liz? No, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Liz, do you have any communication with geoscientists in the mining industry? Do we have any? Uh, not the. Um, we have minor. We have the mining geologists in in the company. So I'm just thinking of globally. We do actually, and um, we've got un we've got unconventionals, you know, we've got un unconventionals business, and we we communicate that way. Perhaps not as much as we might. What, what's driving your question? Mm. Well, uh, the, what's driving my question is, you've got a superb industrial procedure yourself, and I'm sure that uh, geoscientists working in the minerals industry might benefit from some of the things that you do. I'm sure they would. That'd be nice to know. Right. Bring it on. Uh, oh, well, loads oh. of questions. Uh. <laughs> over here. Just comment on that from a recent conference. The minerals industry is learning tremendously from the petroleum industry in terms of the workflows and the thinking in terms of going from your early exploration phase right the way through. Uh, it's Thank you. Tremendously. Thank you. 
have one more oh, question. Sorry, his, his hand was up slightly, <laughs> slightly <laughs> first. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Thanks for a great talk. Um, oh, pleasure. We've seen from lots of operators at the moment that they have a cloud strategy. Mm -hmm. So it's a good point, and I think Nick tried to address it again this morning with respect to sort of the carrot and the, and the stick. Um, and I think it also depends on where you are, in, A, in your hydrocarbon funnel, uh, because, of course, the further up the funnel towards exploration you are, the less inclined you are to collaborate, uh, because you've got a competitive advantage there. Um, when you're in a, in a JV, then you know, what's the problem? you're actually trying to, to achieve the same thing, which is maximise, generally, maximise the recovery out of the, out of the hydrocarbon, uh, hydrocarbon resource. Um, I, I think you'll, you'll hear a phrase often, which is we're feeling our way into the future, and I, and I, and I think that is, is true here as well. In some respects, we're in uncharted territory. Um, but, I, I mean, I come from the place of let's try and solve these things together, uh, and... Um, trying to find where we do actually have to have meaningful um, walls for, for good reasons. And, and not everybody thinks like that. But Great. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Please.